would you please give it up for the Fairley Brothers and Bennett Yellen. I just want to say a gentleman left you guys wine, so uh, just as a thank you. Uh, and we've got waters. Uh, so audience, um, like I said, I'm gonna ask just a few questions and we're just gonna go straight out to you. So you have your questions. So uh, Peter and Bobby and Bennett, I think the first thing I want to say is, uh, you know, I was sitting in the back and I was thinking about this before we showed it, but it's funny how movies play during certain times. And I think we all just need a laugh after these two years. And it was cathartic. So thank you very much for a very funny comedy. That's a really good crowd, by the way. Very loud for how few are in this huge place. Like, we've got, yeah, we've got uh, almost 400 in here. Oh, really? It is, I know. It's a 2,000 seat theater. Yeah, no, it sounded like, like 399. But... <laughs> So before we go to questions, and I don't want to forget, so Bennett was telling me, your Ira Yellen, uh, one of Bennett's uh, family members, is responsible for why we have the million dollars still in existence. So I want to give him a shout out before we go to questions. I just want to say my first cousin, Ira, uh, who's no longer with us, but he loved Los Angeles, grew up in LA like me, and uh, was, became an urban planner, loved downtown LA, and actually he formed a company, and that company, took buildings like Bradbury Building, uh, this built this theater, uh, Grand Central Market, and even Union, uh, or the Union Station, and they, they preserved them and restored them. So Woo! watching Dumb and Dumber for the first time tonight in this theater is kind of sweet. So we owe it to you. So my, my first question is, uh, because you guys wrote this, well, you know, I always wonder about this, because you see old Hollywood movies where screenwriters are like in a bungalow, and they're standing and smoking and drinking and pitching jokes. And, so what was your process writing the script? Start it out? Why don't you start it out? I'll just, I'll just remember. Well, we used to, our bungalow was Bennett's apartment in uh, Santa Monica, and the three of us would get together every day. And uh, we, we, we meet around 11 in the morning or something. And yeah, we, now, I was up at 7, but they were, they were there at 11. Yeah, 11. We don't start too early. Uh, get all there at 11, then we talk, you know, read the paper. Yeah, and we work till about 6 or 7. But what we tried to do every day is we, we were young, and we tried to write five pages of screenplay a day. And if we got to, if we wrote five pages, we'd say, that's it, we got five, we're out of here. We'd, and we'd come back and, and, and do it, try to do it again. We'd rewrite what we wrote yesterday. We'd go in and polish it and probably cut it down to three pages. And, uh, and th but then we'd try to get five more. And we always, we always wanted to make sure the next day that we had some sort of momentum going into that next day so that's why we would rewrite what we wrote the day before, just to give us like a roll before we went in. Yeah, that was a, that, that's of course a Hemingway thing. He would always quit when, before he was done for the day. So you could pick right up and you're, you know, when you start the next day, you're writing already. It's a, it really is a good, <laughs> it's a good policy. But, by the way, we didn't write five pages a day on this one. We wrote this script and remember how fast we wrote this? We wrote it on the Cape, remember? We were, we yes, were okay. in Papa My it. understanding is we wrote it in 19 days. <laughs> it was about that. Did and you just say popping acid? No, no, no. Oh, I'm popping acid. Not popping acid. Not, not, not popping acid. It would have explained a lot, though, right? I was like, where? We were in Papa and we, um, we were Papa Nasset is a community on oh, the Cape Cod. It's called Papa <laughs> like, How did we never think of that? Papa I'm Nassit. going out to Papa Nasset this weekend. <laughs> That's been sitting there for our whole lives. No one ever said that. It was the lowest hanging fruit ever. <laughs> well, but the reason we did it so fast is because, and we couldn't tell this story for a long time, <clears throat> we were not legally allowed to, but this originally was John Hughes's story. Yeah, he had a story called Ski Nuts. Uh, uh, just the idea of guys driving to Aspen, two dumb guys. And you know, there were a lot of writers came in and pitched it, and we gave our pitch, and when we pitched him, I remember he, was, he literally fell on the ground. I think it was when the bird's head fell off. And, and he literally went to his knees and he said, this is it, we gotta do it, you guys are the ones. And we were so inspired by that meeting, that we went and we wrote it really, really fast. We wrote it in about three weeks, I think. Yeah. And then um, by the time we were done, we handed it in and like two, three, four weeks passed, we're not hearing anything. 
and we found out his deal had been at, I think, Warner's or Universal. He had left there, gone to 20th Century Fox, and he wasn't reading any any of his uh, old stuff at Universal. So yeah, he had a he had a bad breakup with them, and it was ugly, and and we had, were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so it was just it was dead in the water. But fortunately, we got it back in turnaround like a couple of years later, right? Yeah. But with the he said with the proviso, he said. You can take it around and try and set it up, but you can't use my name to set it up, and if you do, you have to pay me a million dollars. Do you remember that? Yeah. And I always wanted to say, like, people said, how'd you come up with this idea? I wanted to say, well, John Hughes came up with it, but we couldn't. And uh, it's too bad, because uh, <laughs> we have now, so... <laughs> any uh, relatives of John Hughes here, we're, we'll see you in the lobby. Uh, John Hughes is dead, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I never heard how he felt about it. Uh, we never found out. Right? Oh, no. Well, and, and so, uh, so I just have two more questions. We're gonna go on. So the second one is, you, you know, and I just want to compliment you guys. I, I was a waiter when I was 19, or I think I was even a cashier. And at that point, it was Kingpin that had come out. And all the waiters in this restaurant in Orange County were just coming in quoting jokes from Kingpin. And, uh, and I remember one waiter named Dennis loved the joke about the bull, which I loved as well. Uh, and, and so my question is, you guys have this great sensibility that's really hard to put your finger on, but it's very broad, but it's also very clever, and uh, the jokes uh, stick with you. So I'm just wondering, I, I know it's sort of hard to talk about sense of humor, but here's my question. How did you guys know when someone was working and you were like, great, we can move on? Because comedies seem very hard to write where you've got to keep the plot going, but then every set piece should be just comedy to let Jim Carrey or Jeff Daniels go, and that seems like a very tricky thing to do, to tell a story and at the same time just have set pieces that are hilarious. So I, how did you guys know when it was working? You know, we, we, don't, we only think we know when we're doing it. We, we, you know, if it makes us laugh, that's, that's the starting point, but, uh, and then we'll film it and all that, but we don't really know what works until you test it and show it to an audience, just like this audience. I mean, this is many years later, so we kind of have an idea what worked in that, but when we made the movie, we didn't know what was, uh, what was going to work, which jokes, would, and sometimes, you know, the ones you think are going to work don't, and sometimes the ones that you don't even think are a joke become a big laugh, and we got a lot of them in this movie. Well, the interesting thing is, like, some of our more well-known jokes in this got no laughs when we tested it. Like, you know, so, so, you know, so you're telling me there's a chance. That was like, crickets, <laughs> nothing. But, but we were thinking, that's hilarious. Like, that we love this. And then, you know, a minute later, he said, what was all this one in a million talk? No laughs. <laughs> no. And the studio said, well, you got to cut the mil you know, million and one joke. We're like, no, no, we really like that. And they're like, no, get some laughs. Listen, they would tape it. They would tape the screenings. Listen, you hear it? There's nobody laughing. Wow. And we're like, yeah, but I think it will grow on people. And they're like, that's crazy. Just cut it. And we're like, no, we, we don't want to cut it. They said, well, you got to cut the second one. If you don't cut the first, you at least got to get rid of what happened to all this one. And we fought them. We said, no, please don't make us do that. We really like that joke. <laughs> but, but I remember the one that we went to the mat with, you know, the artist was that they wanted us to cut when Jim went to the, uh, when Lloyd went to the window and he said he needed someone in his life. He was sick of being a loser and he, he was sick of having no one. And, and the studio was like, what that? That does not belong in a comedy, and for whatever reason, we really liked him doing that. Well, also because, as we told them, we said in two minutes he's selling a dead bird to a blind kid in a wheelchair. So, you, you, you better like him. If you don't like him, the movie's over at that point. So that's right. Yeah. My, my final question, an audience, and I know you must talk about this a lot. One of this, I mean, and there's a lot of strokes of genius in the movie. You've got Jim Carrey at his prime, and you, you know, you guys have a great road trip story. But Jeff Daniels, and I know, I know it gets talked about a lot, but I have to imagine no one was like, there's the guy who plays against Jim Carrey. It's Jeff Daniels from Terms of Endearment and Purple Rose of Cairo. So I'm just wondering, what was that like casting him in that process? And then were you surprised at how well the pairing worked? I'm just curious about the story behind Jeff Daniels. Well, I actually wanted Jeff Daniels before I wanted Jim Carrey. I didn't know who Jim Carrey was. He hadn't become big yet. And I knew Jeff Daniels, but mainly from uh, Something Wild, the music, the movie Something Wild. I just love that movie. One of my all-time favorite movies. I've probably seen that movie more than any other movie outside of like Wizard of Oz or something like that. I love it. I love the look. I love the music. I love the feel. I love the whole vibe. And I thought he was hilarious in it. And I, I kept saying, you know, I want that guy. But the studio was 
once we got Jim, they were like, no, you should get a comic actor. I said, well, you know, he's not writing it. He's just going to act in it, so, and he's a great actor. He could do whatever he wants, and this guy's as talented as anyone. And it was a battle, and we finally had to get him to read with Jim Carrey. And, and he blew Jim away, and Jim was like, I, I, we gotta get that guy, because he, he had me on my heels, I'm, I was afraid of him. I was like, no, that, that's it, we, we read a lot of comic actors at the time, and were, Jim was like, in the zone funny. Every single thing he did was hysterical <laughs> in, in those days. And, and nobody could keep up with him, so we were thinking like, you're gonna have one really, really funny guy and some other guy who's kind of funny. But we wanted it to be balanced, so, we thought if we go with a real actor like Jeff Daniels, he's gonna challenge him in a different direction Then it's, it's not a matter of keeping up with him comedically, he's gonna challenge Jim to act with him. And there was actually, uh, he, he, was, uh, he, he, was, he was such a different character against Jim that he, uh, I, when we hired, got Jim, we thought Jim was gonna be Harry. Cause we just sent the script out and he said, I wanna do it. Harry on the paper is funnier, it's a funnier role. And he said, yeah, I'm going to play Lloyd. I, and at one point, I actually took him aside and said, are you sure you want to play Lloyd? I think Harry might even be funnier. He goes, it is funnier. That's why I want to play Lloyd. He goes, I want to you know, push Lloyd and then balance it up. He knew. Yeah, he did. I, yeah, he didn't want some guy to have the lesser role. I also remember my, my first day in Utah, I was talking to Jeff, and he said, it's Jim Carrey's a force. He's going to blow me off the screen. And I said, Jeff, you get all the big, you, know, like you get the big laughs in this movie. Trust me, you have some of the biggest lines in this movie. Yeah, but at first he was a little like, the first few days he was a little worried that he was gonna be, you know, like, like boy, do they mesh. I mean, they mesh quickly, you know? Yeah, I mean, the chemistry, you could hear it 25 years later. It's just, there's chemistry. It's a love story between them as much as anything else. Let, let's go to the audience. I wanna say Aaron, Aaron had grabbed me, and so Aaron, you get the question first, and then I'll, uh, right here, so Patrick. Aaron, yes! Patrick. What's up, guys? How are you? Can you tell? <laughs> I'm good. I okay. just want to thank you for making my favorite movie of all time. All right. Thank you. Yeah, this is my something wild. I've seen this movie more than I've seen any other movie. My family grew up with the VHS of Dumb and Dumber in the minivan. So everywhere we went, we just picked up where we left off. My question is this, after the hundreds of times that I've seen it, I still find new things that I never noticed before. For example, if Lloyd didn't mess with Harry and take the wrong exit, they would have hit the cop trap, movie's over. When Lloyd remembers Swanson and Harry says check the briefcase, they would have called her, given her it, movie's over. To go off Craig's question, when you were writing, um, like how intentional was that? Like how, like, or how improv was it that you, that you got to these points and then we're like, okay, Dumb and Dumber is gonna make a really dumb move and push the storyline along even So just to say the question again for people who might not have heard it, yeah. the question is that there were so many great plot beats where they would have been caught and the movie would have been over, but then they do something dumb and the movie goes on. I, how did you come up with that? Was that was that spontaneous improv or? We may have actually missed those just accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there was there was a, there was a plan. No, yeah, they, they, them being dumb was was their saving grace. They did, you know, they, they killed Joe Mental and, and and all that by you know by mistake, and he was going to kill them, and so they you know their their dumbness came it was their was their weapon. And, I and there was a lot that was ad libbed, like, you know, there was stuff, but the script, we really, all the plot points, you know, we had them in there, but the script, uh, uh, there was, like, when he walks out of the bar and he sees, we land on the moon, that just happened to be in that bar we were shooting at, and, and Jim just did it. And we're like, awesome. <laughs> The, the uh, big gulps, eh? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Well, see you later. The most famous laugh probably from the movie is the big gulps line that not written. No, no were, those guys were, the, guy, the big gulp guys were just hanging around while we were shooting. And I, I, I said, hey, you guys want to get in this? They're like, sure. I said, stand there. They had big gulps. I didn't give them to them. They already had them. And I was standing there watching, and I said, Jim, on the way out, talk to those guys. No lines, and he just did that. <laughs> and that's the confidence of a first-time director. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right here. Um, uh, come on, I'm just gonna take this off for the... Um, 
I've been watching the movie since childhood, and I've always wondered, in the scene where Jim Carrey has the dream, and he's <laughs> with Mary's family, and he says the joke, do you love me? No, but that's a real nice ski mat. Is there a full <laughs> joke to that? Or is, I've always wondered, what is the full joke of that? So that, the question is, I guess, I guess everybody heard of it, the question is in the dream sequence when Jim Carrey does the punchline, uh, the ski mask punchline, is there a real joke behind that or was it just punchline? I think about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is not a real joke behind that. <laughs> Give a whole different answer, right? Really? I was gonna say there is one, I think. But Google it. Google it, because that's what Google's for. Yeah, if, if it was like you know, wrapped them, uh, damn near killed them. <laughs> <laughs> it was something like that. You know, everyone, you know, people know that joke, but it, it wasn't that. So I think we, it was a nonsense. So we came up with just a, what sounded like there was a great joke. Yeah. Guys, I'm sorry. throwing the peanuts in the face. That wasn't written. He was just there. He, we couldn't stop. Him. Uh, up at the balcony, I want to make sure. Yes, over here. I don't, no, I don't I, think there's I, anyone we'll, in. We'll go two in the balcony. If there were two questions, we'll go one, two. Yeah, go for it. Um, do you guys write the, the, the crime plot before you guys write the dialogue? You know, with movies like this and Me, Myself, and Irene, you know, it has such a, like a, a crime thriller kind of involved in it. You know, when you guys are writing the script, which part of that comes first, you know, with the dialogue, or is it you have to make the, the plot points and... Right That's a great question. So I'm sure everyone heard it, but do you guys do a like a treatment of the plot points and then come up with the dialogue and the jokes, or how does that work? Not really. We don't we don't do treatments. And and whenever a studio would say, "Can you write a treatment?" I'd be like, "Oh my god, are you kidding me?" That's like that's harder than writing a script in some ways. Uh, we let it happen as it happens. But the first thing we do do is we figure out who are the characters and how we can make them likable enough to get away with our jokes. That's the first thing. Who are they? What's their problem? Why do we like them? Why do we want to follow them? Correct. Yep. And uh, I think that we we kind of get to the point where we, as the writers, would want to see when we're starting. We'd want to see what the first act might look yeah. like. What the first act of the of the movie might look like. And beyond that, we wanted to find it as we were writing. Like if we had worked it out in advance, we always kind of thought, well, if we know it in advance, the audience watching it is going to be able to figure out everything that's going to happen. But if it takes us, you know, months to write, we're writing a screenplay to figure out how they get out of this and what happens at the end, and that the audience is probably not going to be ahead of us. Yeah. We would we would bite ourselves into a corner where we would sit for days trying to figure out a plot a plot point that we couldn't get beyond until we figured out, and we were just it was like a, days of thinking to just, for a plot point to get us to move on, finally we get it and we'd be like, no one's gonna figure that out if it took us right. days. And that's a, the exact expression we, we'd use. we say we you know, painted ourselves into a corner here. So, and again, if it takes us a week to figure out how to get out of it, the audience is not gonna figure it out in 10 minutes, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and in fact, when we did something about Mary, we were on page 40 or 50 and all of a sudden it occurred to us, everybody knows she's gonna, he's gonna end up with Mary. It's like, it's a done deal. It's like, why, why, why watch the rest of the movie? You know what's gonna happen. And we actually stopped writing for about a week. And we were just kind of like, Jesus, what's the point of this movie? If, if you know up front. And then, and then we happened to see the movie um, uh, Bottle Rocket, Wes Anderson's first movie, with, you know, the Wilson's great movie. And I loved how that movie started. They had a five year plan, they're gonna rob mom and pop stores, then move up to banks, then save all their money and then retire. But on the first night, they, they stop at a motel, Luke Wilson falls in love with the chambermaid, they don't leave, and it becomes the movie, it just follows its own track, path. And I, I remember showing Bob, and I was like, you gotta see this, because we, it occurred to me, he, he, he doesn't have to end up with Mary. We had that in our head, he had to, but we thought, why does he have to? And so from that point forward, we wrote it not knowing who we would end up with. And it wasn't until the very end when Brett Favre came in and we, we said, you know, she had, <laughs> Brett Favre, right. yeah, that she, he, she ends up with him, that, that literally at that point we thought, oh, wait a second, now they think she's with Brett Favre, let's get her back to, to, to tech. So we had to fool ourselves to write it well. I don't think he was expensive. No, no, he, he, was, he wasn't our first pick. <laughs>
we're, we're New England Patriot fans, and we were trying to get Drew Bledsoe, who was a quarterback at the time, and uh, he was going to do it, and then he got in some trouble, so he couldn't do it. We went to Steve Young. He was going to do it, but he was a, his Mormon, he had so many kids that were... <laughs> the influence that he said, I can't do it. Uh, oh, so Brett Favre and he did it. But he was great. We, we, we love Brett. We, uh, we had a, another question up there, I think, did we? No? In the balcony? Uh, do you have any regrets if you can change anything from that film? Ooh, in wh which film? Uh, did, did you have any regrets in films that didn't make the cut or changing anything? You know, I haven't seen this movie in its entirety, probably. <laughs> <laughs> since, since the Cinerama Dome when we showed it at the premiere. I've seen bits and pieces over the years watching it. It's always on TV. But uh, I, I was surprised uh, just watching it here that we did go pretty broader than I thought a few times. Like when he was on the chairlift. And the, the chairlift is completely disassembled. And he's like, <laughs> Getting out of that you don't, you, don't, you don't really look back and miss stuff. There's very few things, you, because we fight our battles with the studio, and if we really believe it, like the million to one thing, which they were like trying to get us to cut, we no, 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 we fight it and fight it and fight it, and hopefully get it. But there have been one or two things in other movies, I, I don't know about this one, that, we, I mean, we had a lot of, didn't, did we shoot the thing where they paid, they, McDonald's, this is something that actually happened to us. I can't yeah, believe we shot it. And we, we had a seat. This, we're driving across country, Bobby and I. I don't know if we might have been stoned or we're just stupid. We pull into a Burger King, we pay, and we drive away. We don't get our food. <laughs> and we're, we're like an hour later, and we're like, I'm still fucking hungry. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, yeah, We didn't get the food. <laughs> On. The people from the, they must still be baffled. Like, they gave us the change and we drove along. <laughs> and we paid them $13.50 for nothing. Yeah. Well, so we've done that, we cut it, but it, it was probably a fan, you know, funnier in real life. But so, so I had a question, and but then I go for it. it just, there's, there's like a, we had nothing to do with it, but there's a, a, a version of Dumb and Dumber that the, un, I think they said unrated version, where there are alternate takes, we had nothing to do with it, alternate takes and, and longer takes and stuff, and we hate that version. We yeah. not, I mean, so that's like a version of the worst of what you didn't want cut that suddenly put back in it. You, you know? were telling me before yeah, you were like, that, I did not want that version shown here. Cause and occasionally you run into that, somebody's playing that one, and that's just a studio grab for more money. They're like the uncut version, like yeah. it's better, but. No, this is the, was, this is the yeah. movie that we like, that, yeah. that you know. Yeah. So I had a question, and then I saw, uh, we'll go to other questions, but I was reading, uh, and correct me if I read wrong, you guys wrote for Seinfeld? Is no, not really. We pitched, uh, we pitched that is uh, something, we pitched them some stuff and they bought this ideas and then did them like the Virgin episode, but we never wrote for Seinfeld. We, so, we sold Seinfeld some stuff. So my question was more, it, it, so you, you eventually went on to make the Three Stooges, and there's definitely some Three Stooges humor. You can feel it in Dumb and Dumber. And I'm an L.A. native, and that was on, Three Stooges were on at noon all the time. And I'm just wondering uh, if you could talk about your love for the Three Stooges and, and what their humor means to you. Because it's so different from the Marx Brothers when you yeah. see the Three Stooges so broad and... Well, The Three Stooges is very physical comedy, and physical comedy kind of holds up over the years. Like, uh, if Pete and I watch, you know, Abbott and Costello or those guys, some, some of that is like witty repartee, and, and when you watch it years later, it doesn't seem that funny, to us anyway. I, I'm not speaking for everyone, but physical comedy is always funny, and so that, that's what it was about The Stooges, it's just, it, it, it just, you know, years later, they were way before our time, but we, like you, after school, we'd come home and they were always, always on be on TV, and it was just, it was just always, you could watch an episode or two and always laugh. So we, we love those guys. And we were probably more influenced by TV than movies, because we didn't have movie theater in our town for most of our lives, and so we would see like one or two movies a year. Uh, but TV, like The Three Stooges or Andy Griffith Show, which we've talked about a lot, we watched Andy Griffith's show pretty much every day for an hour while we were writing. Oh, he would break, he had to take a nap at 3.30 to 4.30. And Bobby and I would watch Andy Griffith's show for, you know, back to back episodes. Yep. I used to wake up from my nap, I could hear <laughs> the end credits. I gotta get back to work. Uh, other question, yes. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, can you 
you talk about the second Dumb and Dumber and what your thoughts were about that? And you talk about fighting with producers. Was that different on the second one compared to the first? And what are your thoughts on it? What are your thoughts on the second Dumb and Dumber? The, our second one, Dumb and Dumber 2, T.O., because it was Dumb and Dumber that we had nothing to do with. That was just the studio doing it. I loved it. I, 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 I had a ball. First of all, Jim and Jeff love each other. They're completely different people. They're like Jeff, Jim, Jim is just a beautiful guy. Love Jim. But he's, he's a needy guy. I mean, he's a needy actor. He's always looking, what, what, what do I do? How about this? How about that? How about this? Jeff's the exact opposite. Jeff, do, Jeff is like, the less you tell him, the better. It just he wants to, and sometimes I would actually feel guilty because I spent so much time talking to Jim all day, and I go to Jeff and I say, hey, listen, I hope you don't think I'm, you know, not giving you enough. He goes, no, 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 this is good. This is good. Just, yes, I'm fine. <laughs> you, you, and and so those two love each other because Jim. I would say Jeff Daniels is the perfect person across from from uh, Jim Carrey. Uh, I totally agree. Yeah, uh, but we yeah we were very proud of uh, Dumb and Dumber too. It was 20 years later, and uh, it was just so much fun for us to get those two guys back uh, together. It, it didn't have the, you know, the, you're not it's not going to be remembered like the original one. But I think a lot of sequels are like that. But it, it was fun for us to do, and we were proud of it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear about your grandpa. But I just wanted to say, like, your, your guys' movies are really, like, I don't know, just eye-opening, and it's, you make people laugh. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, there wasn't a question there, but a big compliment. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, and Charlotte was great. We, 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 we loved uh, filming with Charlotte. It was in the spring, and it was just, it was just so much fun to be there. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. And our condolences to your family. I'm so yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, and then the gentleman in front of her. Stand, yeah, go for it. wearing leopard print underwear and like sexual undertones. I guess the question is, did you guys sort of try out a lot of stuff and then you were like, it doesn't work? Or? I, I uh, Yeah, there, there was a lot of stuff we tried, like any movie, and that you cut some, some works, some doesn't work. And uh, But I always, you know, honestly, the, the real love story in Dumb and Dumber, I always felt was Lloyd and Hare. You know, they love each other. And so, like, putting them in the hot tub and all that stuff, like, I remember one or two people said that we were, you know, making fun, but I wasn't. I was like, <laughs> yeah, we didn't, we didn't think we were being homo homoerotic, uh, homophobic assholes. As we, <laughs> if anything, it's homoerotic. Those guys really did right. love each other. And, <laughs> and uh, so they, they, were here first. they would probably end up together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to get, I know, I've seen your hand, so go for it, sir. Rumor about Todd Rungan making yeah, well, Todd, Todd did the music on this, and I love Todd Rungan. I always have loved him, and and so when I, we had our first chance to make a movie, they, like who do you want to do the music? I was like Todd Rungan. He had never done anything, but he was happy to do it. He came in, and uh, yeah, he did a great job. But he didn't really get the movie, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, a soundtrack that's so iconic and yet doesn't necessarily feel like it's the vibe of the movie, I guess. Well, I remember, you know, I loved Todd. He was great. And he was quiet, and he'd sit around, and we'd go through the whole movie, and we were hanging with him for a month or so. Yeah. While he's putting all his pieces in, and one day, it was like, we're locking the movie that day or the next day, and we're cutting down little tweaky cuts, and and uh, we were arguing about one little thing, should we keep it, should we take it out, should we keep it? He hadn't said a word about cuts. And I look at him, I go, hey Todd, what, what do you think? Should we, should we cut this or not? And he goes, you're asking me? He goes, 
If you're asking me, he said, I'd cut two-thirds of the movie. <laughs> and I looked at him like, Fuck, we're locking it in an hour. How mean. Good thing it wasn't a week before. So let me, I, I want to get the wings to the gentleman back there on the, I guess it would be audience right. Yeah, go for it. Yes, uh, so Peter, this is for you. What lessons did you take from this movie and apply to Green Book? Because I believe that Green Book is a validation of both you and your brother's talents and how it works, and obviously the Academy agreed. So I'm wondering if you can think about it, how could, what lessons from Dumb and Dumber could you take to a pristine, amazing movie like Green Book? How can, how did that inform? Yeah, and th that's actually a question I was going to ask to all three of you. I noticed all you guys have all worked in different genres, and you've moved from TV to movies, and I've noticed action films and dramas and then comedies. So the question was, what did you take from the, this early run of comedies that then applied to movies like Green Book or other things you did after Dumb and Dumber? Um, well, thank you very much. That was very nice. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, it's... The thing that shocked me, because we had done all comedies before that, or pretty much all comedies, is that it was no harder, to, it was easier to do Green Book. It was, you know, it was, first of all, it was based on something that had happened. I had details. We didn't have to sit there and make it up. And you didn't have to get a laugh every two minutes. You know, you don't have to constantly look for that laugh, which is by far the hardest part. It's not the first part, as I was saying up here. The first part is finding those characters that you like enough so you could hang those jokes on them. But, um, you know, we always loved our characters. And, and I remember we came out here, our, our heroes were the, the uh, Zucker Brothers and Jim Abrams. And those were the first guys we worked with, too. And phenomenal guys. They, just, they, were, they were the guys that we idolized and still do idolize. And, and I remember, you know, watching uh, Airplane and thinking, imagine if you had an airplane, but you felt something for the characters. <laughs> Seriously, because Airplane's is joke, 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 joke. And you, you like the characters, but you're not really afraid that that plane's going down or that something bad's going to happen. And I thought, if you could do something where you have that kind of broadness, but you have a little more at stake, and that's why we had this thing that, you know, Bobby was talking about at the window, Jim Carrey, where he gets totally real, he goes, I don't have anybody, I don't have anything. And it made you care a little more. And, and, and all our scripts, we try to do that. We feel if you can care more about them. And Green Book is just taking it to that next level, I think, where you really start to care about them because it's more real. And, uh, but, you know, I guess what I learned is it's, it's writing comedies is such a hard thing that going into that direction, it, it was, easier probably yeah and and that's why we love the uh, Andy Griffith show so much is that yeah. because they had these you know they'd have broad characters they'd have the Gomer pile and you know a couple of people in the town were yeah they were they were broad but then they'd have episodes like where where Opie you know kills the bird by with his slingshot and it's and his dad has to talk to him and it's like well that's very real and and that you didn't really know what you were if it was going to be a real one or if it was going to be broad. And, and we just love that, the uncertainty of it. Because the comedy works better when you're not, when you're not certain that it's, going to, it's not going to be joke, 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 and you're going to be expecting a joke. And so that, that kind of influenced us. And it, you know, and I realize you don't mind, I, I had two questions. I've I got to make sure I get in here. One w would be a crime if we didn't, is you guys are brothers. So, and you know, there's, there's a handful of filmmakers, the Coen brothers, the Farrelly brothers, now the Softy brothers. And I'm just wondering, how do you guys work together? I mean, and I come from a big family, and, and it would be a dream to like work with my family on creative stuff and work stuff. I don't know that it's always a dream, but how do you guys work together? How do you realize, oh, we're going to not only be family, but we're also going to professionally work together? Well, it was kind of like a band. Like, you know, the three of us had our own things to do. Like, you know, I, like it really was. It's like, you know, you have like a certain kind of thing. Like I was kind of this, the through line, what the story type thing is. And these guys would be more the comic guys throwing jo jokes out. Like I'll, I always remember the time you came up with the bird's head fell off. Yeah, and and yeah, we had that. And, and he said, well, how did it happen? Because he was pretty old. And I just remember <laughs> <laughs> You just made the move. You know, but like I, it was like a band, and you had different instruments to play. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the advantage of 
us being brothers and the Salkin brothers and all them is that, as we're mentioning, the, the studio's always trying to get you to water it down, to do whatever was done last year, you know, and to make it more vanilla. And when there's two of us, we, we were just, we were that much stronger, two of us directing, three of us writing. It's like we were just that much more like, wait a minute, we don't want to cut this, do we? And if, and if we agreed that we didn't want to cut something, we, well, we're probably going to really go to go to war over it, you know, or, or go to the mat over it. But if you're just by yourself and the studio's telling you to do that, I could imagine you'd be like, oh, oh, oh okay, you know, and it, it's harder to stand up to everyone, but with two, you're, you're yeah, if one guy gets weak, like, you know, I don't know, maybe we should cut it. No, we shouldn't cut it. It's, 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 yeah, you're right, we won't cut it. Whereas you would, you would get, and that's why I think a lot of these brother teams are they very specific what they do, because they have an idea and they fight their fights and they win them, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of fight. The, uh, and the other question, just you've made a number of movies with Bill Murray, and uh, I, just out of curiosity, it's almost a selfish question. What's it like to work with Bill Murray, and what does he bring, uh, just in terms of a comedian, or to these movies that you do? Because his his role in Kingpin is hilarious. Uh, but I'm just, what's it like to work with Bill? The Murray? very first day Bill Murray showed up on on Kingpin, we you give him the sides, what what you know, the, what we're gonna shoot that day, and he just. Took him, took a look at it, crumpled him up, and threw it away. <laughs> like, wait, wait a minute! He's like, he's like, I, I, I got it. And then, then he did it completely different, but way better than what we had written. And so we realized, okay, that's Bill Murray. And Jim Carrey's like that too. Jim's gonna, he's gonna take what you say, but he's gonna make it his own in a way that's, you know, he's just, it's, it's a gift. I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's elite. And, and Bill's like that. And elite let's talk comedy. about that before. So in Dumb and Dumber. Would you do the thing where you'd shoot a number of takes and you'd do something different every take and you'd pick? Or how, how did Jim Carrey work? Because this is one of those movies at the height of his, as someone was mentioned, that night, that year was like The Mask, Dumb and Dumber. Uh, Ace Ventura. Yeah, Ace Ventura. So what, how did you work with him and how did you discover how to get the best out of him? Well, we, we always would just shoot what was, uh, you know, on the page first, and then we'd just say, try, you know, go nuts, try something else. Bill Murray, more than anybody, would just do whatever he wanted. And what we quickly learned with Bill is don't cut, because he'd have his last line and be cut, and then he'd say three funny things, like, oh, sh shit, we shouldn't do that. And that's why you get the, like, you know, hello, you know, hi, not you, you, hello. You know, that was just us not cutting, and him just coming up with stuff. I want to get Bennett into the Yeah, picture. let's do I it. I feel like we're, we're fine. No, no, I'm learning so much. Well, no, so Bennett, let's, oh. and you know, and I, I said at the beginning, but let's, you're absolutely right. The only reason this is happening is because of Mr. Bennett Young. Yeah. So when you guys, yeah. no, no, no. You know, it's just lovely to see it in the audience. Because I mean, there's probably a lot of people here never saw it in a theater when it came out. You saw it on VHS or you grew up with it on DVD. So to get people to see it in a theater is lovely and to, to just hear everybody laughing, it's a really beautiful sound, you know. Well, so how did, so Bennett, I'm gonna throw, how did you, how did you meet uh, Peter and Bobby and how did you guys decide to write this together and why did you feel it was a three-person script? And... I, I met Peter my first day of graduate school in uh, UMass Amherst and met him and, uh, and we decided that we had it right away. I mean, we met first class, first day. We instantly became friends. Uh, and, um, and we said at some point, we should write a movie together. I, like, neither of us had any connection to the business. I was from Los Angeles, you were from Rhode Island. We didn't have relatives who were, and we just we decided while in graduate school to write this ridiculous comedy and uh, this thing called Dust to Dust, and we wrote it, and then, this is a much bigger story, but um, we took a break, we were, all, we were almost graduating, and we took a break for the holidays, and you were on a date in New York, and, uh, and you called me up and you said, I was on a date, and the girl said that Eddie Murphy moved in next door to her, her parents in Alpine, New Jersey, and I was like, really, did you ever see him? And he's like, yeah, he was washing his car. You gave him our script, Dust to Dust. Um, meanwhile, I was back here in Los Angeles for the holidays, and my sister would go uh, folk dancing, Israeli dancing, and she knew David Zucker. And so I said, Freda, would you go? My sister's name is Freda, by the way. We did, we, yes, we named Freda Felter after my sister. My sister did not catch on to that name for years, by the way. Uh, and so uh, I said, Freda, give, give David Zucker dust to dust, and she gave him dust to dust. And uh, we, and they both, got, both Eddie Murphy, 
Oh, she, oh, the girl called you and said, oh, I, like a week later, I saw him coming out to get his newspaper and I handed it to him. And, and we were like, great. You know, and then months later, they got in touch with us. Eddie Murphy called us. Uh, he, was on, he was on Letterman and he was talking about it. Letterman was asking about yeah. it. Like, like, didn't it? Because the Los Angeles Times did an article about what's Eddie Murphy going to do next. And the first line of it was Eddie Murphy was looking out his Alpine, New Jersey home when he saw a neighbor coming across the street with a script. Uh, and so that got us started. We, uh, Murphy wanted us to write something for him, and David Zucker read it. Years later, so David gave it to his brother, to J Jerry, and then Jim, and they hired us to write something. We came to town, and we, but years later, I thought, I thanked David. I said, David, I just want to thank you again. You know, you got us started. He said, I just really wanted to date your sister. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but thank God he, he did. You know, there's, a, there's a thing, and I've said this a lot, and it, it, it's not my thing. It's you, Goethe uh, said many years ago, you know, how, however long ago he lived, he said, once you take your first step towards your, you know, follow your dreams, uh, providence unfolds in ways that you could never have foreseen, and it, and it will help you if you are following your heart and doing the thing. And that's what happened for us. It was like, you know, one of, you know, every one of these things, the Zucker brothers and Eddie, Eddie Murphy, and then we get out here and you know, I, I was rooming with Woody Harrelson and you got, you know, you know, everything just connects one to the other. And you look back, you can't believe how magical it was when we were just, you know. I, I do want to explain the third part of this is that, so Pete and I started writing together and, and what we would do is Bobby would always read our script. We'd always give Bobby our script to read. He always had fantastic notes, great jokes to add to it. And at a certain point, we were working on a project, I think we were doing a Dragnet 2 or something, and Pete said, we should ask Bob to join the partnership. And I was like, absolutely we should. He's, he's fantastic. And that's when Bob joined us, and, and you know, uh, uh, and fate ensued. Or whatever fate does. So, so we were writers then, we were screenwriters, and we wrote for, and did nothing but write for a long time, and didn't have a lot of success, and we'd go back home to our hometown, and they'd say, what are you doing? And they'd go, oh, we're screenwriters. Like, well, anything I would have heard of, and, and nothing had been made. We had written a lot of scripts that got bought or optioned or something like that, but nothing had ever been made, and so uh, it was a little frustrating, but I'll say this, years later now, after we, to be a writer, a director, you know, and the director edits too with an editor, and my editor, Julie Garces, is here tonight. Uh, Thank you, Julie. But the hardest thing we do, far and away, is the writing. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's, that's the hardest. That's the hardest because you're creating from, you have 120 blank pages of paper, and it's like, fill it up with something hysterical that people are going to be interested in. That is a challenge. So we're going to ask two more questions, and then I have a final one, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. Well, Let's you. go. Uh, I want to go, yes, right here. Uh, how important was it to uh, let the uh, um, the actors improvise? How important was it to let the actors improvise? Oh uh, well, yeah, it's very important because you know you come up, they come up with stuff. It's not just your brain. Like I always say, you know, I that you know, if you get everything you want in your whatever you're doing in your life, if you get it your way every way, well, it's going to be as good as you could have come up with, you could have imagined it. But when you don't get everything you want and you let the universe come in, then all of a sudden it's bringing things that you've never done. And it's like Jim Carrey was the 150th guy we offered Dumb and Dumber to. I can't imagine anybody better, but it, it, we didn't get our way. We got Jim Carrey, you know? Right. And, and seriously, and then all of a sudden you got this magical thing, and that's how it is with improv, with actors, is that we think we know what it should be like, but after we're done, like, come on, go nuts. And they come up with like Brett Farmer or Raw, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> awesome. That's good. You know. So yes, it's extremely important. I think I think great directing is great is great casting. Like a great director knows how to cast a movie and, and you know the actors to bring in and then there's that synergy and everything like that. So and you guys are you're just wonderful at that. Yeah, so there's a follow up. So when you're casting them, uh, do you uh, have them improvise uh, in the casting process? Oh, in the audition? Do you have them, do no. you have them improvise in the audition to see if they have chemistry? No, but everybody who comes in and auditions will, will put a little bit of a different yeah. take on it, and so they might go off the page a little bit. And if they do in a way that, 
you, you find amusing. It, I think it's a plus. Yeah. So let me get two more questions. I want to I want to make sure that everyone who wants to. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay. Um, watching this film now, it seems like it really started a whole slate of comedies that went on for a good 20 years afterwards. And nowadays it seems like there's a big dearth of comedic films. And I'm curious what your take on that is and, um, and why that might be. Yeah, uh, I get the question if I understand it is, is Dumb and Dumber inaugurated this era of comedy and now it seems like there aren't the, the comedies that there were. What are your thoughts on the state of the movie comedy? I, I think it goes up and down. You know, it, it'll, it's not, comedies aren't dead. You know, I, 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 if you want to have some laughs, it's not the greatest movie, but I laugh my ass off is uh, Bad Trip, this year on Netflix, with Eric Andre. Like, I, that, I watched that several times. Just, it, it's got tons of laughs. And by the way, oddly, I'm not mentioning it for this, but I just recall, basically I read an article about those guys and they said, yeah, we just want to do our own Dumb and Dumber. It's pretty much Dumb and Dumber. If you look at the plot, it's unbelievable, like, what they do, but it's bad. I mean, it's its own thing. It's not, like, a rip-off remotely. They just went off and did their own thing. When, when we made Dumb and Dumber, I think the thing that was different about it than the movies that had been made previously is that they were all those Eddie Murphy, Chevy Chase, kind of Bill Murray movies where they were a little bit smarter than everyone. They were always, like, a smart Alec wise guy, but deep down, they, they were, like, really smart guys who just would give it to the you know to the system a little bit, and we and obviously Harry and Lloyd are not smart guys, and we had a hard time getting actors to even consider the role. Remember, we had to we actually had to change the title of the movie to get actors to read it. They didn't want to read something called Dumb and Dumber. It hadn't been it hadn't come out. They didn't know that it would be a hit or anything. It was like Dumb and Dumber. No, I'm not. what was the title that got them to read it? We had we at one point we changed it to. Go West, which is something that they had to say in the movie. Uh, we, a power tool is not a toy. A power tool is not a toy. That was the title. Might have been a better title, even. <laughs> a power tool is not a toy. And I think Jim Carrey read that script, and then when he got on board, he was like, oh, it's kind of a clunky title. We said, well, it was Dumb and Dumber. He said, ah, oh, yeah, let's go back to that. Yeah. And, and Bennett, your thoughts on the state of, of the comedy? Well, I, I mean, uh, I have no thoughts about it. No, I, I mean things. Are, I, I will say this: that that this movie. I don't know if you could, if we made this movie today, we would have had to change. It would have had to pull things out of it. Maybe change things. It, it, like there's a, there's a, there's kind of a, a a tightness in in what you can get away with today that we could get away with in 1994. Uh, thank goodness. And I think hopefully things will swing back to that sort of you know because because this movie is just it's just stupid idiotic fun. <laughs> That's all it is. Yes, final question. I see you up there in the balcony. Go for it. Yeah. Hey, um, you, know, you guys got a really solid uh, John Denver joke in there. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, it took, you know, a big part of the movie was an asshole where John Denver lived. Did you guys ever hear work, you know, work that kind of thing? <laughs> what did John Denver think of Dumb and Dumber? Nobody, no, <laughs> nobody ever gets in touch with us about anything. No, we never heard from him. <laughs> No, no, we didn't. No, it, it was glad. Huh? Yeah, we, we called him. What did he say? He's full of shit. Tons, so tons <laughs> full of shit. Out I did hear that Jeff Daniels said that, uh, that after the movie came out, Dustin Hoffman called him up and said that was one of the most real relationships he'd ever seen in any movie. Like, he commended him. I heard a great story. You guys have heard this, too, where, like, Clint Eastwood came up to Jeff Daniels. Have you heard that story? I don't know if the audience has heard it. Does any do, one of you guys want to tell it? It's hilarious to me. My understanding is that Clint Eastwood came up to Jeff and said, that bathroom scene, that happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the final question we ask whenever we do a Q&A is, um, it's, a, it's, one, it's a big one, but, but many people out here are filmmakers. There are a lot of young people out here. And, you know, you guys have made a career in a very tough business, but you were talking about Gerda and following your dream. It's a very basic question, but knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to people who want to, you know, make movies and tell stories and pursue this really hard thing? Wow. Um, 
I think that the, the bottom line, this is what I say to people who always ask me, I say, you, you have to believe that you, if you give up, someone's going to take your place. Like, like there, there, there are people dropping right and left who give up. Don't give up. Absolutely, be absolutely firm and certain that you're going to make it and do everything you can. Do everything. Give, give the script to the girl you're on a date with. Give the script to your sister who's going folk dancing. You take, take every opportunity. Don't give up because there are people who are dropping out. And when you don't give up, you rise. When they drop off, you rise to the next level. And you're, yeah, and just trust in yourself. Trust in yourself. Yeah, and mine, mine is kind of like that, which is basically that there's a lot of fear when you get into, you, you want to do what we do, or, or a lot of dreams in life. It's scary, you know, if like, because there's a good chance you won't make it. So you have this fear in you, and I always say, just remember, that fear is your friend, because that fear is in everybody, and a lot of people don't do it because they can't get by that fear. So when you wake up with that feeling like, God damn it, what am I doing? I'm 34 years old, I haven't got my movie made, I'm like living in the air. Well, that, that, that fear, the fact that you are pushing forward and trying to do it, that's what, that's what your friend is, and don't be afraid of that fear. Just accept it because it clears the table. It gets a lot of people out of the way that don't have the courage, because it is hard. It's the hardest part is making that first commitment. Like, you know, like Bobby was saying, we didn't get a movie made for, you know, we were out here nine years before we got a movie made, and you gotta go home all the time to, you know, see the friends and the family, and then, what are you doing? It's like, eh, you know. Yeah, and then you're waiting tables and, and bartending, or, you know, I was driving a limo, and, you know, that, that sort of thing, while, while you're doing it. And I heard guys are like, we come from the ultimate ball buster place, Rhode Island, it's like Jersey. And you come home and they're like, hey, Hemingway, get over here, get over here. He's a writer now, Hemingway, tell him, right? Like, what are you writing? Like, I just uh, you know, it's, it's, you've got to be able to put up with that kind of, you know, embarrassment and, and, and you know, for many years. It, it's hard, you know, and then, you know, but that's a pretty good impersonation of dad. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby, any, any, any? Uh, you know, it, it, it's probably something. It, it's almost a cliche, but it, it, it's definitely true. It's just write, write what you know. You know, it's like don't try to write something that you don't know anything about. And a lot of the stupid things that happen in this, in this, Dumb and Dumber were just things that. <laughs> Pete and I, like, would have happened to one of our friends, or, you know, we exaggerate it and all that, but, like, with the, the driving, you know, going through the McDonald's and, you know, not paying for it and that sort of thing. We, it's just stuff we put in the movie, because it happened to us, and so we do, believe it or not, it is a comp you know, a loose compilation of it's stories. It's semi-autobiographical. <laughs> Yeah, so, I don't know, just keep it real for yourself, whatever, you know, keep it true to your own life, and, because everyone's got a different experience, so don't, don't try to write what we do, or do write what you do, you know, but, so. So, I want to, uh, I want to thank the audience, you were a great audience, I want to thank Bennett Yellen and the yeah. third audience. Thank you very much, thanks for coming thank out. Thank you guys really so much. It. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, really good.